We'll now call upon Paul Mazza to give us his paper on completing the sale. Paul. Thank you, Paul. While you've lasted this long, we only have a little ways to go. We'll try to move through quickly. Completing the sale, what I've tried to do in this section is sort of pull together everything that you've heard today. It's really the meat and potatoes of what we're concerned about, and that is what do we do when we act for purchasers and what do we do when we act for mortgagee vendors. The guidelines are set out under Section 34 of the Mortgages Act. And it's only those guidelines and, and it's only that section that we can address ourselves to when making our requisitions. I've provided a precedent requisition letter at page N51, but uh, section 34, in effect, indicates that evidence of sale papers that uh, must be deposited on title will include a statutory declaration by a mortgagee, its solicitors or agent as to the default, number one. A, number two, a statutory declaration proving service, including production of the post office receipts of registration. And thirdly, a statutory declaration by the mortgagee or its solicitors or agent that the sale complies with part three, and if applicable, part two of the Mortgages Act. Now once you receive that information, Section 34 goes on to state that it is conclusive evidence of compliance with Part 3 and is sufficient to give a good title to the purchaser. Now, I've, I've tried to establish a, a checklist for you, beginning at page J2. You check the mortgage document to determine if there exists a power of sale clause and also the term and the length of time default must continue before an effective notice of sale may be given. It's usually 15 days. Determine from the mortgage account if there's any specific address or manner of service. Check to make sure all the dates and registration particulars are referred to. And I'm going to subsequently, after just elaborating on this list, provide some suggested remedies. Uh, the only one I want to refer to, or the only two I want to refer to, is F and G. Uh, the Diane Durham form, uh, I hope they've discontinued it, but uh, it was an unfortunate event for a solicitor who sent out a notice of sale on a mortgage on a Diane Durham form, and their form indicates the sale complies with Part 3 and then puts in brackets, and we're applicable with Part 2, and there's some instructions in the left-hand column that say, please delete one or the other. The solicitor sent out the notice without deleting the part that said, and also in compliance with Part 2, Madam Justice Van Camp held that that was ambiguous and uh, held that the power of sale was null and void. And G, uh, Reed Salchitsia and, and, and Reed, another interesting case where the mortgagee solicitor signed his own name with no reference to the fact that he was a solicitor, nor any reference to the name of the mortgagee or the fact that he was acting on behalf of that mortgagee power of sale was held to be null and void. We've already talked about the right number of days for redemption. We won't go over that again. On J, if there's one thing uh, I'm going to leave with you today, and I'm sure all of you will remember, will, this, will be this point. Double check the date as stated in the notice of sale against the date of the post office receipts of registration. Under the Mortgages Act, specifically Section 33, service is deemed to have been given on the date on which it was mailed. So quite often, when you get the notice of sale documents, you'll look at the notice of sale, and you will look at the date that is located at the bottom of, or just above the signature, compare it to the redemption period, count the number of days, and feel satisfied. You may be in error, because you must look at the post office receipts. It may say dated January 1st, but some secretary or ourselves have neglected to mail it, say, on January 4th. The date for running is January 4th, and you count the number of days from that date, not January 1st. I'm sure all of you will run back to your offices after this lecture to check your old titles. And besides, Toronto is uh, infamous for post-dating their post office receipts. There's another thing. If you are sending a secretary or a law clerk uh, to the post office, 
please have them double check the post office receipts of registration. Make sure they check the stamp. Uh, we, we've talked about some of the examples that we've incurred where the stamp was given 1969 when it was 1979 and where a person has attended on January 1 and for some reason they put January 3rd. So it's important to make sure that the person who is sending out the registered mail looks at the sheet uh, that indicates the, the, the date that you've attended. There are other items there I'm going to leave you to read for yourself. Now, I pointed out to you that you can only insist upon those items that are in Section 34 to satisfy yourself. I request other information, although I cannot hold a vendor mortgagee bound by them, but they help with subsequent requisitions, and I've outlined them at page J5. Uh, Subparagraph B, there's been some question as to whether or not the original post office receipts of registration are required. Uh, I think that they are. If you read the wording of Section 34, they don't say original. They say post office receipts of registration. I'd recommend that you use the original post office receipts of registration. If you search titles that indicate that only copies have been put on, in my opinion, I think that they're still okay. Our whole system is based on affidavit evidence, and if somebody has sworn that they sent out the registered mail on a certain date and provide a copy, I would think that that would be satisfactory. To avoid the problem, use the original post office receipts of registration. I asked for a copy of the sheriff's certificate obtained at the time the notice of sale proceedings were commenced to be attached as an exhibit. It makes it a lot easier when I'm reviewing the documentation. A lot of requisitions come in from solicitors that I find who, when they've done their sheriff's search, point out to me that there are executions that have uh, shown up on title after the date that the notice of sale was sent out, asking me to have them removed. The decision of Remora versus Allo, it's not in my notes, it's in the back should be put in beside uh, paragraph C on page J6. The citation is 1971, 18 Dominion Law Reports, third at 396. The case stand for the proposition that uh, any execution creditors that appear after the notice of sale has gone out, um, they do not interfere with the notice and they do not have to uh, be served. A paragraph D, I ask for an additional clause to be inserted. It sort of uh, protects us against Section 30, Subsection 1, Subsection 4 of the Mortgages Act that indicates that uh, if we are aware or have notice in writing of, of, uh, from the Crown or other public authority claiming a statutory lien against the mortgage property, then they must be served. So it may not appear, they may not appear on the abstract, but you may have some notice. I've never come across it in my experience. A great many solicitors requisition this. This is a famous requisition. It's, number one, they would like the statutory declaration sworn right up to the date of closing. Not a requirement under Section 34. And is it a practical consideration? Well, as indicated to you earlier by Martin, the rights of a mortgage order to redeem expire once the offer to purchase is entered into. Uh, there is a practical problem. When statutory declarations are sent off to the institutional clients for execution, many of them are out of town or it's just not physically possible to execute and have the document sworn on the date of closing. Uh, the simple answer is it's not required by Section 34. If I can give it, I will, but if it's not possible, it's not a valid requisition. If you are acting for lenders whose mortgages are insured with CMHC or M MICC, especially MICC will require an assignment of the judgment that you obtain on the personal covenant which will occur at the time you issue a writ for possession and personal covenant, you will, you will obtain judgment and they take an assignment of that judgment 
So the requisition should be a request for an assignment of judgment if you are acting for, a, for CMHC or MICC in that regard. What do you do if you have defects in the notice of sale on a mortgage? Well, Madam Justice Van Camp provided the solicitors with some relief. And it, the bottom line is that each error must be determined on its own merits. Madam Justice Van Camp states at page 6, 615 of the Recomry Lumber decision, a notice should not be held inoperative simply by reason of minor irregularities as long as it meets the purpose for which it, it, it is required. Section 27 of the Interpretation Act provides where a form is prescribed, deviations therefrom not affecting the substance or calculated to mislead do not vitiate it. It still begs the question whether it's a minor or major uh, defect. Obviously, I've, I've set out some examples which I think are major defects where there's not been at least 15 days of arrears, where the redemption period is not sufficient, where the notice is not signed, where all proper parties have not been served, obviously the notice is uh, null and void. The answer is at that stage, you get a little nervous if you, if you fall within that category, and then you attempt to rectify the situation by bringing a Section 38 application, which is an ex parte application under the Mortgages Act, trying to obtain an order permitting you to sell without notice. They are not as difficult to obtain as you might think. There are precedents in the back. That is one possible solution. We also talked about a situation where the power of sale was conducted, say, five, six, seven years ago. And now that all of us are well informed as to what the proper proceedings are of power of sale, there will be many, many requisitions relating to past defective power of sales. And many of those power of sales have, been come, have become defective because of recent decisions, which were not available at that time. I think the only possible answer is to obtain an order under Section 38, nunc pro tunc, now for then, and uh, it should uh, satisfy that uh, defect or clout on title. The, at the back of the uh, book are precedents for, uh, for statutory declarations to be put on title under the Registry Act and the sale papers as required under the land titles. Kindly be aware that the land titles offices require pre-approval time. It goes from three days to 14 days in some uh, municipalities and uh, registry offices. Give yourself enough time to have the documents uh, pre-approved. Lastly, the, the precedents do not provide to you a second page of a registry deed. And uh, I'm, I'm specifically referring to the uh, covenants, usual covenants that are provided, the four covenants, quiet enjoyment, etc., and the release, uh, proper conveyancing indicates that the usual four covenants are not to be provided. Uh, I refer you to the Conveyancing Law of Property Act, which indicates the covenant that can be provided by a mortgagee under par of sale. The specific section is uh, section 23, subsection 1, paragraph 3. And I'll leave you to uh, look that up yourselves. The mortgagee's obligations on completion of the sale, I'm just going to highlight that briefly because Wayne Gray will elaborate. Obviously, you have to pay any outstanding realty taxes in accordance with the statement of adjustments. You have to, uh, we have a policy of holding back some of the net sale proceeds to pay any outstanding utility accounts that may arise or any other surprises that can occur. We notify the municipality of the change of ownership as you usually do and you notify the condominium corporation if applicable and then you must make your accounting to all subsequent encumbrancers. I, I would like to state that uh, if there's anything that we've left you with today is that uh, you should make sure that your errors and omissions premiums are fully paid. 
because this area can be quite uh, complicated, but very, very interesting. Thank you. He wants me to introduce him. I don't know why. This is Wayne's big moment. Now, this is a very important topic because this is where we fall awry of many, many problems, give rise to support to decisions to commence litigation, and that is the accounting for the sale proceeds, something often ignored when you send a letter to another lawyer. Wayne has a uh, lecture on that issue, and uh, I'm sure will give you many, many highlights uh, from his practical experience. Wayne? Thank you, Philip. Well, we've reached the end of the day, and we've managed to sell the property, and we've got a lot of money in our hands, and the question is, what do we do with it? We can't keep it all because, as you know, under a power of sale procedure or mortgage remedy, you cannot keep all the money that you get on the sale of the property. Unlike foreclosure, you simply don't get the whole thing. You just have the right to sell and take out what you're entitled to. The business of accounting for the sale proceeds is a rather vague and gray area. There's virtually no case law, and solicitors are largely left to their own devices and experience in deciding what to do in dealing with the proceeds of the sale. In light of the comments made by Martin Stambler earlier today about the obligations and liabilities of a solicitor, and in light of the increasing number of cases that are coming to light with respect to alleged solicitor negligence in the handling of um, files, it behooves any lawyer to very carefully consider what is to be done in the accounting process. After the sale has been completed and the solicitor has the funds, there are at least six items that have to be considered. First, there's the liability to account. Secondly, there's the application of the sale proceeds. Third, <coughs> conflicting claims to the surplus if there is any. Fourth, the accounting procedure that's to be followed. Five, the payment into court if necessary. And six, the mortgagor's right to to a strict accounting from the mortgagee exercising the power of sale. Now, keep in mind that when the power of sale is affected, that prior encumbrances uh, are not dealt with. They're not affected by uh, any of the proceedings, and therefore, no accounting need be done to them. However, the prior uh, encumbrancer does have a right to either be paid out in full, or the property will re remain subject uh, to that claim in priority to any claim or interest that the purchaser under the power of sale has. The mortgagee's concern is going to be with the interests that are in the property subsequent uh, to the mortgage. That, uh, those interests can include a subsequent mortgage, any claims under the Mechanics Lien Act, a security interest holder such as consumer's gas with a uh, uh, notice of, uh, of security interest for a furnace or whatever that's been installed, any public or private utility claims, a spouse of the registered owner, and the present registered owner, himself or herself. The obligation to account for the uh, sale proceeds is largely one founded on the uh, labeling, if you want, or categorizing the mortgagee exercising the power of sale as a trustee. Now, Rather than get into the fine points of whether a mortgagee is a bare trustee or an express trustee or what have you, I just simply commend the materials on pages K2 through uh, K5, and it discuss, uh, some of the, it discusses some of the, uh, the origins of the question and issue as to the obligations of a mortgagee as a trustee. Old English law uh, says basically that the mortgagee is constituted a trustee of the sale proceeds, if any, after satisfying his own mortgage. 
In Ontario, the courts have found that the mortgagee is a trustee for the surplus of the sale proceeds beyond that required to satisfy the mortgagee's mortgage and the cost of the sale. However, and just to help us out, the fourth edition of Falconbridge on page 750 says, it seems to be more accurate not to describe the mortgagee holding the surplus as a trustee, but to say that the mortgagee is liable to account for the monies received to the use of the mortgagor or other persons entitled. Now, how the, how the mortgagee is going to account for the proceeds and apply them is dealt with uh, in two ways, both under the Short Forms of Mortgages Act, specifically Schedule B, Item 14, and also under Section 26 of the Mortgages Act. There seems to be some difference, or appears to be some difference, in the method by which, or the, the calculation or the procedure by which the mortgagee must apply the, uh, the mortgage, uh, uh, the sale, rather the proceeds of the sale. However, in practical terms, it all results in the same thing. And basically, the priorities are that the mortgagee will first pay the costs connected with the sale, which can include paying taxes, uh, valid public utility charges, rents, insurance coverage, valid repairs, and costs related to the actual completion of the sale. Secondly, the mortgagee would apply whatever is left over to uh, interest and then principal on his or her mortgage or its mortgage. And third, there's the question of surplus that has to be dealt with if there is any. Quite often there isn't. The reason why I decided to do this paper is because of a substantial number of complaints that I've been hearing from solicitors acting for subsequent encumbrances as to the quality and quantity of the accounting procedures. And it's quite obvious that many mortgagees are simply not prepared to provide an adequate accounting. The precedents in the material are designed to assist you in determining what kind of documentation you might want to use in doing that accounting. And I've tried to approach it from a practical point of view of what is realistic in a very practical day-to-day -day practice that involves a lot of sales of this nature. The types of subsequent encumbrances that you're going to have to deal with is going to lead to questions of priority. And that is probably going to be the big, biggest problem that you have. Uh, but first, before we get to that, uh, I want to just make a few comments about the types of costs that you can uh, hope to cover out of the sale proceeds before you determine if there's any surplus. First, it includes taxes, as I mentioned before, insurance premiums, water rates, repairs. There's also the matter of the mortgagee solicitor's legal costs, which have to come out of the sale proceeds. With the inception of the Family Law Reform Act, there's a very open question now as to the rights of a spouse to share in the sale proceeds uh, after the sale has been completed with the elimination of the Dower Act. And there is no decided case law on point. However, it's possible that the rights of the wife or husband to share have been somewhat diminished as to the uh, question of quantum. Uh, I can't make any other comments because there has been no question put before the courts on that issue. The calculation of the mortgagee's account is very important. Now, Martin Stambler made some comments to you about calculating the mortgage account where you have uh, the mortgagee taking back a mortgage. It may result in the accounting procedure not being completed for some years down the line. There are a variety of questions there. I'm not going to deal with them. It's not very often you get into a situation like that, and I want to just sort of cover the bare bones. The uh, rule for application of the sale proceeds and calculating the mortgage account is uh, generally set out in Sun Life Assurance Company and the George Coles um, uh, decision, which is a, uh, the leading decision with respect to uh, accounting. It's uh, found in 1952 Ontario Weekly Notes at page 677. And basically it says that the costs of the sale and costs due under the mortgage uh, are to be dealt with first and then the sale proceeds should then be applied to interest on the mortgage account and then applied in reduction of principal. The right to share in any surplus that's left over has largely been set out in the case of Remortgage Discount Limited and Bushell which is a 1927 decision of Chief, then Chief Justice Meredith. 
The right of subsequent encumbrances to share in the surplus has been firmly established in Ontario. There should be no doubt about that. The problem is dealing with notices of claims, what kind of claims you have to deal with. It is not good enough to simply have search title prior to serving your notice of sale and then relying on the results of that title search to determine which, which people have an interest in the property. The best procedure is, is as soon as the sale is completed to go and do another title search and make further inquiry as to new interest holders. There may be new execution creditors, there could be cautions on title under the Land Titles Act, there could be some notation as to spousal rights as a result of some action under the Family Law Reform Act by one of the spouses, that sort of thing. The absence of actual notice on the part of the mortgagee of any other claims uh, should normally allow the mortgagee to be able to simply pay the money out to the mortgagor. However, the question is what is actual notice? And you have to protect your client in this regard because in most cases, whether your client is an institutional lender or not, they're simply not going to know anything about that. All they want is the money, but the obligation falls to them to determine if they're paying out the money in the proper fashion to the right people because they may be faced with an action commenced against them for an accounting which may result in a significant claim for damages uh, which will definitely reduce uh, their, their return on the sale of the property. The best way, in my view, of determining what it, the interests are after you've done your title search and protecting your client is to do the following. First of all, don't turn the money over to your client, especially if it's an institutional lender. Some institutional lenders like you to send the sale proceeds along to right away. My experience is that they put it into an account somewhere in their system and it doesn't collect any interest and they don't invest it at the best possible rate and they take one hell of a long time accounting to people for it. The best procedure is for you to take the money, especially if it's in sizable chunks, if you know it's going to take 20 or 30 days to get the accounting procedure wrapped up, get it into a short-term trust note of some kind bearing the best possible rate. Do not put it in any speculative fund of any kind, but make sure it's tied up. Make sure it's tied. Don't let it go to the racetrack. Make sure that it's in some kind of a secure note that is maturing over a very short period of time so that it's bearing interest, because that interest is going to, uh, can properly be claimed, in my view, by one of the subsequent encumbrances down the line who's going to have a shortfall, and they're going to want to know why they didn't get that extra two or three hundred bucks because the money wasn't invested and it was sitting in your trust account bearing absolutely no interest whatsoever. In determining whether you should pay the money out or not, you have absolutely no statutory guidance, you have no judicial pronouncements, you have to go on what is common sense. What you ought to do, in my view, is consider requiring a statutory declaration as a proof of claim made out by the person entitled to the money indicating exactly what is owed to them so that you and, and, and with the proper clauses in the statutory declaration as you'll find in the precedents which have a tendency to protect the mortgagee from any claims with respect to, to the subsequent mortgagee's claim on the portion of the surplus that they warrant. Secondly, you'll want to have a final release and indemnity from that person. You don't want them coming back a couple of months after you've finished the file and put it away and saying, uh, excuse me, uh, we want to review the accounts again, or we have a claim against your client. If any subsequent encumbrancer doesn't want to give you that final release or the indemnity or the proof of claim, you better think seriously about paying any money to them whatsoever. They should be prepared to give you that documentation. The procedure in doing the accounting is really rather simple. First of all, put your shoes, especially if there's a solicitor on the other side in that person's position, they have to explain to their client what happened. Quite often they don't know what happened, A, because you may not have told them, and B, because they've just let the file ride waiting to see the outcome of your mortgage remedy proceedings. A letter, and there's a sample in the precedence, setting out what happened, explaining the basis of what you've done, and including supporting documentation such as the, the appraisals that you obtained, the listing agreement, the statement of adjustments, uh, supporting invoices for any really extraordinary expenses such as taxes 
or maybe there was a lot of broken windows or a roof had to be repaired or something of that nature. It certainly assists the subsequent encumbrancer in understanding just what you've done with the file and why they may not be getting all of the money uh, to cover their claim against the property. And they'll have a shortfall and they'll want to know why. The letter should be accompanied by some kind of calculation of the surplus. And again, you'll see a precedent in the materials to show how you've arrived at that figure that you propose to pay out to all these encumbrancers. And then, in addition to that, there should be some uh, scheme set out, some proposed distribution, uh, distribution scheme, so that you give them the opportunity to review it and possibly object to the scheme that you've proposed. In doing that, you're going to have to make some determination as to priorities, and that's where the problem really lies. You've heard enough today from the various speakers about competing claims, whether it's uh, claims under the Tile Drainage Act, the Family Law Reform Act, Mecla uh, Mechanics Lien uh, Act, or any similar legislation which sets up some kind of claim against the property where people may not only be competing against you, but competing against each other. For instance, all the Mechanics Lien claimants may have uh, expressly uh, indicated that they are ranking subordinate to your mortgage, your client's mortgage. But if they haven't got to pretrial yet, and there are several lien claimants, some of those claims may not be valid. They may be dismissed, the actions may be dismissed, in which case, how can you possibly pay those people the money, only to find later on that they had no claim at all, and that you have some kind of liability, or your client has liability for having given them the money in the first place. Also, the Family Law Reform Act, that great piece of legislation that was designed to sort out so many problems is, in the words of Mr. Justice Howland, creating work for thousands of lawyers, because we still can't figure out what the act means in many sections. If you pick up the ACWS uh, blues that are come out every so often, about a third of the cases are in family law problems. Well, a lot of them deal with the rights of spouses to share in proceeds of the sale of property. I would direct you to read the case of Ree McGorn and, uh, and Garnet and find out what happens when uh, spousal interests are involved. A second mortgagee there just simply has a mortgage that isn't worth a darn as a result of that decision. And the appeal was dismissed. Don't put yourself in a position of having to de determine the priorities between claimants. Let the courts do that. Don't put yourself in the position of being judge as to whether somebody's claim is, being val is valid or not. If you do that, you run the severe risk of your client being sued and you being held negligent for your ha handling of the file. If you suspect that there's any problem with priorities, take advantage of the Trustees Act and you can make an application. You can do it on notice if you want. Under the uh, sections uh, uh, 61 and 36 of the Trustees Act, for an order allowing you to pay the money into court. And then when you pay the money into court, serve a copy of the order on everybody, sit back and let them argue it. There's, just going back to the question of holding the surplus while you're doing this accounting, there's an old English case which suggests that the mortgagee may be liable in negligence if the surplus is allowed to remain in the mortgagee's solicitor's hands without the consent of those entitled to the surplus. That's the only case that I've been able to find on point. There's certainly nothing in Canada that I have found. However, that case has to be restricted to its particular fact situation. In that case, the solicitor hung on to the surplus from 1878 to 1891 <laughs> and um, <coughs> kept paying the second mortgage the interest on the second mortgage representing to the second mortgagee that uh, everything was copacetic and, and fine. Finally, uh, the solicitor went bankrupt and, uh, and the whole uh, can of worms was opened up. If you hold on to the funds, as I said, invest them, make sure that they are earning interest, and the only question you're probably going to have to deal with is when the interest check comes in, somebody's going to have to pay tax on that. Who prepares the T5 and uh, who do you send it to? Uh, the T5 probably should be prepared by, the, you can prepare it by uh, your, the accountant in your office and send it to the encumbrancer who's getting the benefit of that interest. However, that's open to question. The, the accounting documentation I've already gone over, and it's obviously, as you read through it, you'll see it has to be adapted to any particular, you know, fact situation that you have before you. It is not exhaustive. 
And again, uh, the exp it's only based on experience, and it can be improved upon, I'm sure, uh, by people as they use it from time to time. The things that information that you should get across to the person that you're accounting to is one, the method of sale. That is important. Two, the sale price. Three, the mortgagee's account, the legal costs, and the cost of the sale. And the surplus, if anything's available for distribution, the proposed distribution, and to give the uh, subsequent encumbrancer some idea of what they have to do to get their share. Everybody loves to get information like that, how they're going to get the money. If you provide that information on a timely basis, my experience is that you uh, downside the possibility of having subsequent inquiries coming in long after you've finished the work on the file and you've rendered your account and the rest of the time that you're putting on the file is free. The documentation again, each appraisal, and going back to the comments made by Martin Stamler about appraisals, keep in mind that uh, the appraisal documents are largely, especially in conventional mortgages, the basis of your sale. Uh, if you have a listing agreement, and suppose the property has been listed uh, with repeats because the property st simply hasn't been salable for, for months and months and months, make sure that those various listing agreements and updates are included so that the person reading gets some idea of what you have gone through to try to sell the property at the best possible price. A copy of the agreement of purchase and sale, the statement of adjustments as I mentioned, the mortgagee's final statement of the mortgage account. Get your mortgagee to prepare that and give it to you and see that a copy of that is included with the documentation. And finally, uh, the copy of your draft projected account. And I say draft because you should always make comment in your letter that the legal cost may be subject to increase because you don't know if you're going to have to be put to the task of making an application under the Trustees Act and doing a lot more work, handling a lot more inquiries, and supplying a lot more information before you get down to the bottom line of paying the money out or into court, as the case may be. Uh, the precedents are found, by the way, on uh, precedent section N92, 93, uh, and 94 to 97. A few questions that you might want to consider uh, during the accounting process. One is dealing with lien holders. Lien holders, including claims, uh, claimants under the Mechanics Lien Act, whose liens are subsequent in interest to that of the mortgagee, lose their respective liens on the property as a result of the power of sale. Just a question. If the second mortgagee exercises a power of sale and sells the property and exercises that power of sale, and the first mortgagee thereafter amends its mortgage with the new owners and advances more money, are the lien holders' claims as against the first mortgagee, were they extingu extinguished by that second uh, mortgagee's power of sale? Or have only the rights in REM been, been uh, extinguished and they still have rights in personam? Keep that in mind when you're doing the accounting proceedings because it may be very important as to what you do with the money as against any lien claimants that you have. Secondly, the notice, uh, the provisions in, in, uh, in Harper and Culbert and the Family Law Reform Act, whereby unless the mortgagee has actual notice of other claims, the mortgagee is entitled to pay the surplus to the present owner of the property. Uh, a few notes going on to uh, types of claims that arise under other legislation. In this case, the Personal Property Security Act. And the question here is, does the Personal Property Security Act supersede those of the Mortgages Act? For instance, Section 69 of the PPSA says that that act overrides any other general and specific legislation except the Consumer Protection Act. There were comments made about that earlier. What obligations do you have to go down and search for financing statements that might affect the power of sale that you have taken that were registered subsequent to the exercise of your power of sale so that you have to account to the person who holds that financing statement? In light of the decision in re Ehrman, which was talked about earlier, you might want to seriously consider that as a conflict of priorities or claims and taking the payment into court route to avoid any difficulties of challenging claims between under the PPSA Act and uh, signees of mortgages. The third question which you might want to consider is in the case where 
Well, actually, I'm sorry, I dealt with it. It was the question of, of paying out interest to uh, subsequent encumbrances after you've uh, invested money in a 30-day note. Be very careful about that, about making sure that there is a uh, appropriate uh, Revenue Canada statement issued, because if you don't, you may find that either your law firm or you, if you're practicing on your own, gets a little notice from Revenue Canada and they'd like you to pay the tax on that interest that you got and paid out to somebody else. Be very careful about that. The, finally, just a few notes. The accounting process is, is largely one of common sense. As I said, there's no statutory guidance whatsoever. There's no judicial pronouncements of any kind. Hopefully the Law Reform Commission will attend to something like that. Secondly, the increased exposure of lawyers to claims of negligence in, the hand, in handling their clients' briefs behooves any lawyer to take great care in doing a proper accounting. Even if it's an institutional law, uh, um, lender, as I said, most cases they have no idea what the accounting process is all about. You have to hold their hands and walk them through it. And your failure to advise them of the risk of following a certain procedure may lead to you being found negligence. And I think Martin Stan Stambler had some comments about that. And there are materials uh, that are included in the Canadian Bar Association's program on real estate that was held yesterday. Thirdly, remember that the solicitor on the receiving end of all this information that you're going to be giving them has a client to explain all of this to. And it's a matter of professional courtesy to make sure that you assist them in being able to explain that within, within the parameters of your responsibility to your client. Finally, these procedures are not the last word and they must be adapted and they must be reviewed in any particular and specific circumstance. The precedents that are, as I mentioned, that are uh, recommended are for guidance only and should be adapted to your particular file in your particular case. Well, we've got to the end of the line in uh, power of sale under uh, uh, notice of sale. And uh, far from having to account to subsequent encumbrances, it's discovered that there's a deficiency. There's not enough money from the sale to cover the amount of the mortgage. What further action can the mortgagee take at that point? Jerry Udell, who spoke to you this morning, is going to cover that issue. When I... Uh when I was given the second topic to talk to about this morning, I thought it was appropriate since my wife had decided to join me on the trip to Toronto and right now I don't know what the deficiency is, but I have grave doubts I'm going to recover it. Uh, in any event, getting, getting to the topic at hand, up to a, about five years ago, four years ago in the Windsor area and uh, very recently uh, in the Toronto and surrounding areas, to consider a deficiency on a, uh, a mortgage sale was unheard of. However, uh, taking into consideration the, uh, the trend in economic conditions, uh, the crazy uh, buying that went on here on almost a suicide basis and now has resulted in uh, inflated prices, artificially inflated, and the results were uh, in many instances private uh, individuals hold mortgages, which in fact if you went to sell the properties today, wouldn't even cover their mortgages, you're running into a situation where you have to uh, deal with the deficiency after the sale on a power of sale. What I'm going to talk to you about in the next few minutes deals with after, what happens after, but also what do you have to do beforehand. There are uh, usually three people, uh, uh, depending upon the circumstance, uh, who you can look to. You can look to the original mortgagor, the person who entered into the covenant to pay. You can look to the subsequent uh, holder of the equity of redemption, uh, referred to in the notes or, or legal title. I, I prefer to call, the, call it the holder of the equity of redemption. Uh, and the third party is a covenantor or guarantor. Uh, I, I highly recommend to you uh, Falcon Bridge on Mortgages, fourth edition, pages 304 to 309, uh, as a background understanding for the development of the legislation. If you're looking to the guy who was in the property and who for all intents and purposes defaulted, you have to rely on Section 19.2. Uh, 
The leading case in the area is the Foster and Wolvet decision, a Supreme Court decision of 1963. I'll let you read the citation. Uh, and has long since stood for the proposition that where there is no express written covenant between the original mortgagor and the holder of the equity of redemption to indemnify the mortgagor, the court will not enforce the provisions of 19.2. I don't have 19.2 in front of me, but 19.2, as I can recall, because I've dealt with it enough, indicates there has to be either an express or implied covenant to indemnify. That uh, decision in Foster and Wolvet has come under great criticism because the question is to what is the implied covenant to indemnify and what does one have to do to uh, connote an implied covenant to indemnify? Uh, it didn't take long, but uh, as indicated, there, there are a slew of decisions that are coming out. Uh, the National Trust Company and, and Fucarelli decision referred to in the notes has scrutinized the Foster decision, expressed some doubt as to the propriety of the decision, and the Court of Appeal law dealing with another matter, has evaded giving the bar an express approval or disapproval as to what connotes the, that implied uh, obligation. Uh, and then a recent High Court decision of, uh, of Maloney J. in Moscarelli and Vers Gurjikin, and it's in the notes again, has adopted the reasoning of the Court of Appeal used in the National Trust case, taken it one step fur further. And Mr. Justice Maloney has said that in the following circumstances, it is sufficient to imply a covenant to indemnify. Where there is an executed agreement of purchase and sale, and which agreement of purchase and sale contains an agreement by the purchaser to assume that existing mortgage, and such assumption is reflected in the statement of adjustments, the court has stated there is an implied covenant pursuant to 192, and you can go after the holder of the equity of redemption. This decision, for all intents and purposes, limits the Foster decision to the circumstances in which that case is found. I, however, suggest to you very strongly that if you're on either side of an action, that you read all the cases, and, I, and I'll get into a, a little farther, but re read the Foster decision because it's highly critical, but it is the law subject to what, you know, what new case law is coming up. The courts have held the mortgagee has to right to pursue either party where there is an agreement of purchase and sale registered on title, wherein one party agrees to make mortgage payment. There's obviously an express covenant to pay. The Court of Appeal in the National Trust case went so far as to say the implied obligation for indemnification arises from the sale, not from the conveyance. So uh, you, you have to look at what surrounded the sale and what was uh, perhaps a consideration on that sale, and you may require parole evidence in that regard dealing with uh, the, the new purchaser who, uh, who for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, you, you're going after, and the old mortgagor who uh, you may decide to make a deal and say in exchange for his giving testimony uh, or evidence, uh, you are going to relinquish your claim, which, would, which is a jeopardy situation you're putting yourself in, but you're going to need his evidence as to what negotiations were surrounding that sale when the new purchaser took it on. If you decide that 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 present holder of the equity of redemption is who you're after. Accordingly, the parole evidence is admissible to show what the real consideration was. Where parole evidence is admissible, you may be, may be able to convince the court as to what the obligations were implied or intended from all the parties in their actions. The GMB case is a, is a decision of Mr. Justice Griffiths, referred to in page L4 of your notes, and it deals where a subsequent charge or mortgage or uh, is held just as responsible for making the payments as the original mortgage are. Uh, the GMB case is an interesting case in that it was an application of the uh, Land Titles Act, and uh, there's a good review uh, by, uh, by uh, the Mr. Justice Griffiths dealing with uh, an assimilation and association of the Mortgages Act to the, to the uh, Land Titles Act and how, how each one uh, was working to intertwine uh, as opposed to the reg registry office system and the land title system. Now, if you, if you want to go after the original covenantor, the original mortgagor, it's not mandatory that he be made a party to, uh, he received the original notice of sale. However, if you want to go after him, you've got to serve him. And uh, I say that unequivocally, although there are no cases on point, 
uh, that's been referred to by Ken Yoles this morning in the, in the Barset case, which hasn't, I don't have a reference for you because it hasn't, hasn't been reported, but that, in fact, was a decision of the court. And, uh, and I'm submitting to you that based on, based on the line of cases, it seems to be following uh, a logical uh, route that if you want to go after the original mortgagor, you have to at least give him notice of your notice of sale. You have to serve him. Um, and the Walden Pape decision follows along that line. I, I caution you upon relying on Walden Pape because Walden Pape is an interesting decision and it deals, deals with uh, remedies between the parties. It's overturned uh, later on by Mr. Justice Galligan uh, on the basis of whether or not to grant an in interim injunction. So, but there is obiter in the Walden Pape case which would lead one to believe in line with the rest of the cases that if you intend on looking to that party on his covenant to pay, you should advise him that you intend on dealing with the security. He is held in the light of a surety uh, with, that, with, uh, with the covenants made in the mortgage, and if you t tend to deal with the security and therefore prejudice him, the courts are backing out and leaning over backwards and saying, you've let him, you've dealt with the item which you took as collateral security or primary security, you can no longer look to that party now for payment on the covenant. It was part and parcel of the original deal. You look at the Canadian Financial Company case, and this is reflected again. It's a high, another high court decision, and it deals with a guarantor. In that instance, the court unequivocally came out and said, if you're looking to a guarantor on the, on the guarantee and you deal with the security and you don't notify him of it, then you definitely have let him off the hook. Uh, the cases follow a line which state where the mortgagee deals either improperly with the security or in such a way that it can't be returned to the debtor's possession the, secure, the, the surety is discharged to the extent that the security would have been applicable to the loss. Following the line of thinking uh, of Mr. Justice Hughes in the Canadian financial case, sections 30 and 31, uh, 30 subparagraph 1 and 30 subparagraph 2 uh, can be applied to indicate that uh, they are a party who appear to have an interest in the property according to the abstract index. Uh, and there is a result once again, they are people who are to be served with uh, the notice of sale. Um, the proposition in the GMB property case was proposed that, uh, to simplify matters, I'll just try to summarize it. What had happened was the present holder of the equity of redemption had decided that they were going to make the payments they assumed the property, uh, the, the mortgage, and they assumed making the payments. The uh, a mortgagee then decided to go after the original charge or mortgagor, and the doctrine of novation was pleaded in the court, saying, uh, "Hey, you know, you've created a new contract by accepting money from these people. Therefore, we are released from the terms and the covenants which were in the original charge." Uh, Mr. Justice Griffiths, uh, wide-eyed and, and perhaps in a very on point, the decision indicated. There is no evidence here that the mortgagee as creditor accepted payment from successive owners on the understanding that these payments would constitute both the new contract and a release from the defendant mortgagor. In my view, the mortgagees here were simply following a reasonable practice of accepting payments. And also, in my view, if you would have held any differently, you would have had a lot of problems. Um, s skipping along, you've got to understand that when you're issuing a writ it's thirty dollars and you're trying to save your client money and what you often do is you try to join a a, a claim in your writ for a possession and on the covenant uh, it has been discussed with you earlier as to when and what you should consider on possession but you should also consider whether or not that is wise whether it's not thirty dollars thrown away there are situations which arise where it is not wise to add a claim for possession in your writ. In those situations where there are condominium arrears which are on a continual basis you'll have to pay and you haven't crystallized your claim. Uh, where there are arrears of taxes or where there is damage to the premises and you're going to have to hire somebody to come in and, uh, and do, do, da do repairs to those damages and you may want possession before you want to claim on the covenant or vice versa. But consider, consider your remedies. Don't just automatically think of saving yourself, uh, your client, the $30, uh, whatever it is for an issuance of a new writ. You've also considered the, the, re the reliability of the mortgage or to be around when you want to serve them a second time. 
they may decide to leave town after they've had one writ served on them or just disappear. Now, 19.3 is dealing with 19.1 and 2. And 19.3 very simply says, you have your choice, but you can't have both. You're either going to uh, get judgment against the, uh, the title holder, the subsequent holder of the equity of redemption, or the original covenantor. It's uh, an alternate remedy. It makes you choose, elect. Once you've made your election, you're forever barred from, uh, from going after the other party. So be sure that you get instructions from your client who has money. Uh, I don't know yet of a, of a case where a solicitor has been sued because he's gotten judgment against one and not against the other. But I can readily see a situation up here where the mortgage company or the client has information available to them which would indicate that the person who is presently in possession of the premises has no money. I mean, that's obvious they haven't been making their payments. However, the person who sold him the premises does have money and is collectible. And uh, it's probably better to go after that party and let him third party the, uh, the present holder of the equity of redemption or do whatever he wants to do, but know where, you're, where you are collectible. It is a practice from my firm on the day when, uh, when we're getting ready to, uh, to sign judgment to get instructions in writing from our uh, institutional clients or, or clients as to who they want us to sign judgment against. And that way you're covered and you've got something in your file and no one can go after you later on and say you blew it. Um, it's good to name all parties in the writ uh, if, you want, if, you're joining, if you're joining claims in one writ. So as you may want possession against one and default on the covenant against the other. There are alternate remedies in my opinion and I think it's proper to be included in a writ. You should uh, further take a look at the precedents at the back. They are extensive. They give you suggested... Uh, pleadings uh, to include in a specially endorsed writ. Now, let's talk about a special endorsement moving right along. Um, up until 1939, the Mortgages Act uh, did not include a section 19. And uh, it did not include various sections which are presently in, in the Act. It's my opinion, and I have a lot of people who agree with me, uh, that the Dominion Fire Insurance case uh, cited in your notes indicates that a claim for possession and a, a claim on the covenant is a proper matter for a special endorsement. And I suggest that when you're faced with a situation where someone is going after you on that basis, that that is fair. That is not to say that a claim for waste or a claim for damages is a, pro is a proper uh, subject matter of a special endorsement. You may want to join claims but however, if you're just going on a, uh, uh, on a claim on the covenant, per se, and a claim for possession, I believe they both are subject matters of a special endorsement. Last but not least, if you have the opportunity, on occasion it appears, you may want to go after the guarantor. I've dealt with the Canadian financial institution, financial company case. I believe it's very clear. Uh, Mr. Justice Hughes has held that a uh, guarantor is a party who appears to have an interest in the property and therefore is properly a party who should be served with the notice of sale. Now what happens if you haven't sold them? All is not lost. I don't think your notice is invalid. It may or may not be, but I think for sure what you've done is release that party from any claim you may have against them on that guarantee. So it's, it's incumbent on you to make sure that you serve that party with the notice of sale if you have any intention whatsoever of going after them. Uh, that doesn't mean that the mortgagor is discharged from his covenant. I don't think that uh, that has been uh, held, but I do, I do think it does uh, deal with you and your remedies of going against the, the guarantor. Um, just in, in summary, once you've obtained judgment, you'll no doubt want to obtain a writ of execution. Uh, you may, you'll usually want to obtain a writ claiming for possession, and we've dealt with possession. Once you've gotten a writ of execution, execution will be levied, levied in accordance with the Executions Act, Creditors Relief Act, Bankruptcy Act, whatever act applies. I'm not going to give you debt or creditor course. I'm just going to tell you, rely on whatever knowledge you have to this point in time or seek, seek competent knowledge and get advice and for the purposes of executing or levying execution in that regard. Uh, the precedent section is extremely helpful. My lord, I wish I'd had it five years ago. 
<laughs> it would have saved me many hours of drafting and redrafting and contestation and, and other things. But I, I strongly suggest that you review the precedent section. Uh, and that's all I have to say on that. Thank you.